Hello students, welcome back to part two of our digital synthesizer tutorial for your new project-based assignment in Computer Programming 11. In part one, we set up our initial key to be able to function, to be able to press a key on our keyboard and have the note play with a visual response showing that the key has been pressed in a way that's controlled and intelligent <clears throat> so that it doesn't play endlessly or way too loud, it's under control, I've made this all happen in the way that I've coded this. And now we're going to add a little bit more modularity and method functionality to this to just up its intelligence and also allow it to be more generalizable so that you can create many more keys with the least work possible. What I'm going to be doing next is setting up my code in my key class to be more generalizable. We've talked previously about magic numbers. This idea doesn't just apply to numbers, however. Notice that in my logic here, I'm doing something really cool. I'm checking if my Boolean is false and also if the key is down. Great, that's some good functionality. However, I'm only able to check it for a single keyboard press. And I'm only able to check it for a single sound file and a, if you, Think, track what I'm saying, basically we're limiting it to one specific scenario. Perhaps we can make this more generalized so that we can deal with all the different types of sounds and scenarios we'll come across in our full synthesizer. So where do we begin? First, up here, what we call our attributes section, I'm going to define all the information I'll be working with in the project. I've already defined my boolean is down, and I'm going to now define two more pieces of information a string, which is text information called key, and another string called sound. Just as a bit of a side note here, notice I've created two strings on separate lines. I could have done this, created a key, two different strings and defined them on the same line. You're able to do that if you want to make things a bit more condensed and concise. But here, I'm just going to keep it more in our, oops, normal way of doing so. Key and sound. These are going to become more generalized variables. I'm just going to space this a bit differently. I prefer it this way. That allow our constructor in a sec here for key to take in any key we send it and then any equivalent sound file that we send it. Here's how this is going to work. In my constructor, remember the constructors have the same name as the class they're a part of. This is what runs when the key is first created in your program. I am going to accept two pieces of information. And the first one's going to be string key, and the second one is going to be string sound. Now, I want to introduce you to one new idea here. The information I include in the brackets does not have to be identical to the information out here. We call this local information. It's simply a placeholder for the information that's coming in. I could call this something different, key name, and sound file, for example. It's not the exact same as the variables up here. I'm just giving information to myself as the programmer, anyone else, and also anyone else who might be running my program, what in type of, like what the information is that will be arriving. It has to be the right file type, but the name can be customized to whatever you want. Feel free to keep it the same if you like, but actually good practice is naming it something a bit different and then doing something like we see down here. When a key is created, it's going to accept information about a key name and also sound file information. As that information arrives, I want to assign it to the variable I've created in this class. First, key is going to be equivalent to the information from key name. The information sent to it from key name will then be assigned inside my class to the string called key. And my string called sound in my class will be assigned the value input called sound file. Now, from outside, later on, we'll be doing the sending from our world class. The information sent in will now be stored locally inside of my key class. Meaning that if I make different keys, many different keys, for example, if I take this up here, oh, I have to change something before I can show the visuals, unfortunately. If I make 14 different keys, for example, each of them can have their own unique key name and sound file being sent 
and thus they can each know their own local key and sound that will be unique to each key so that we can have differentiation between the different keys in our keyboard, which is really generalized and really great. Now that I have this information, I can use it in different spots in my program to make it a bit more generalized. I note down here, I have my key name called key, and down here, I was looking at just the A key previously. Now, I can look at whatever key has been assigned to this particular object, this particular key that I've created, whatever one it might be. Now that key will be checked if it's being pressed down for the unique situation of that key. All this information can stay the same. We wanted to access the play method just like any other key. We want it to use the same white key image. It might be in a different place. Maybe our first one's over to the left and this one's over a bit more to the right. But we want it to use the same type of image for consistency so it looks like a piano and set the same interaction with variables. Down here, if it is down, the same logic as before. And if not pressed down, it needs to be that same key, whatever was sent to this particular object. And then the same logic applies. One more thing for us to change here, public void play, what sound do we want it to play? We want it to be whatever sound is associated with the key that we have sent to this file, which is gonna be the sound file that we sent alongside of it. Recall that we've now defined the sound file named sound. So in the place of the actual specific sound, we can just toss that variable called sound. And that's gonna allow this to now be generalized to whatever information that we send it when we construct a key back in our world class. Let's see the final step here. I want us to create the key in the world actually using the coding, not dragging and dropping and pressing or anything like that. I'm gonna tell Greenfoot, create for me a new key. I'm accessing the class, the blueprints for key. Let's call this, you can call it whatever you want. Maybe you wanna make it more specific. For now, I'm gonna call it key one, just the one key that I'm making for now. So I've told Greenfoot it exists. What is it? It's a new key. There's an error. Let's make sure we remember I'm accessing a constructor. It says actual and formal argument lists differ in length. Back in my key class, key is expecting these pieces of information. One thing I can do here is copy the information and tuck it in here as a reminder. Okay, I need a key name and I need a sound file. So the last time we took the key, the, the first A key. So I'm in place of all the information, I'm gonna send it the string A. This is the A key. The name of the sound file, if I duck back over here, I think we used this one last time, 2A wave. I'm gonna call this the string 2A dot wave, spell it right this time. Now let's check, no errors. I'm sending it the information that it wants. Cool, so now it's gonna be creating a new key with this information that will be processed in the logic of this now object that's it's being created in the world. And now all that's left to do is need to add this object into the world. Which object? Key one. And maybe if I try and like end it here, I'll notice, oh, another problem with the actual and formal argument lengths differing. Notice I need, an, oh, it's not staying up here very well, an actor and then two integers for the location in the world that I want it. For now, I'm just gonna remind ourselves of a couple methods that we can do. Get width divided by two, get height Oop, divided by two. So I'm just gonna create this key in the middle of my screen, basically. You might wanna position it more carefully later when you add more keys in, but for now, bam, it's being added. This key that I've created, its identity, its name is A, its sound file is 2a.wave. It's being created in the middle of our screen. All this information is being sent into our object information, the rules for it, in a particular circumstance of applying that key and that sound that I've sent it from here. Now when I run this, I hit my A key. It works just great. Now what we're able to do is in our programming here, I could maybe think of going, oh, I'm gonna make a new key called key two. And I'm gonna call this A sharp. Or maybe I'll just keep it simple and I'll make it the B key because we're just doing the white keys for now. And for the B key, I might notice that it's called B2.wave. 
send that information. I'm going to add that object, key2, to my world. And in this case, I'm going to go get width uh, divided by 4. I'm just going to put it in a different, it's a new space. You're going to play around your, with uh, your project on your own to be able to find where it goes. And this key, oh, maybe I shouldn't do the height divided by 4. That looks a little bit weird. Okay. And now, in this case, when I am looking here, um, the, when the B key is being pressed, um, actually, I should think about, think this through for a sec. I want this key maybe to be in a different spot. Actually, we'll keep it like this for now. I'll let you kind of figure that how you want to label these things on your own. Now, when I run my project, A plays another original note, and when I press B, plays another note. Cool. So it's very easy to create the different keys with this more generalized way of constructing our different objects. It's up to you now to be able to A, position these right. This next, this key should be to the right of the first one. They should probably be squished together on the left. You need to, in that original project I showed you, create the whole layout of the piano with the white keys playing all the notes that I provided you in the right order. And then also think about adding in the black notes in between. To do so, if I give you a little sneak peek, you're going to have to add a new subclass called maybe black key. Add it with the image of a black key. And then you're going to have to create for yourself the logic behind how a black key functions. Here's a hint for you. It's going to be very similar to the white key. But there's some simple edits to exactly what images that you're accessing and maybe the place that it's positioned on the screen. To consider this project complete, I'd like to see on your screen the whole keyboard with functional interactions from your actual keyboard, able to play all the different notes that I provided you in the sound file attached to the project. So each of these different notes should be mapped to a key in your logic. If you want to show me a basic understanding of what you're doing, let me tab over here. Being able to define the keys separately by writing them each out like this would be sufficient. But if you want to show me a really deep understanding, try and consider, is there a more generalized way you can construct all the keys in the keyboard? Rather than typing in key 3 is new key, key, key 4 is new key, da, da, da. is there a way, now if I'm creating, I don't know how many keys there are in this, maybe like 15 or 20 or something, rather than creating 15 or 20 different ones of these, is there a way you can condense all of that into a much shorter piece of logic to create them automatically for you? That's a challenge task for those who want to extend themselves a little bit further. Attached to this assignment will be also information of what I want you to do once you have your keyboard created. So once this thing's laid out like I showed you in the first place. So why don't I pull that back up just to show you one more time here. The extension after this, the second part to this, is I want you to create your own unique soundscape, meaning that you're going to go and find your own images, your own visuals to have on the screen that might be interacted with. Once it's interacted with on this screen, the key has a unique image that's, that changes once the key is pressed. In your project, maybe you can do something like the size of the key changes, or maybe it moves slightly to show that it's been interacted with. That would be a nice simple way of doing so. And I want you to create your own unique soundscape. Maybe you have a picture of a drum kit with different keys playing different drum sounds. Maybe you have different pieces of text and each time that has instructions. Maybe the text says up here, press A to hear, I don't know, elephant. Press B to hear tiger. Find some sound files on the internet for elephant and tiger sounds or record your own and then have it be an interactable soundscape that you create in your own creative way to really show your understanding of this. And as you do so, don't forget to have um, all of your code organized in intelligent, logical ways. Let me just pop this open really quick here, just as a reminder. What you're working on for now, there'll be instructions and text as well. Create a piano that looks similar to this and functions in a similar way, where I press a key, plays individual notes for each key pressed, black keys included, in ways that I hold the key down, it doesn't keep on playing it forever. When I let go, it resets back to its initial state for each key constructed with object-oriented method design modularity. Let me know if you need a hand. Best of luck with this. Be creative and have fun.